All right, uh, my name is Mark Sims. I'm the lead customer architect for Azure. And um, I wanted to take a 45 minutes of your lives. It's 45 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay, take a little bit of your lives that you'll never get back and talk a little bit about some of the strange, weird, and wonderful things that happen under conditions of extreme success which as anybody knows is the most horrifying thing that can ever happen to software. Because if you design something and it's like a house party. If 10 people show up, it's okay. If 1,000 people show up at your house, it's kind of a giant mess. It's a great story, but it's a giant mess. So the next 45 minutes or so is essentially one or two or three if we get to it, stories of things that actually happened with the customer names and industries and identifying details all sanded off. If I wasn't being recorded, I could be a little bit more honest, but I can't, so I won't be but it'll still be entertaining. Uh, this is meant to be interactive. If you don't ask me questions, I'll heckle you. Uh, folks who've seen me present before know that will actually happen. I'll leave my colleagues alone. Well, my, I only have one here, so I'll leave Dan alone. Um, but by all means, I'm happy to talk about any topic in cloud except for two things. I won't name specific customer names, and I won't talk about roadmap because I don't own any. But past that, any question in the world of cloud is open. If it's something that's a little bit more detailed, we can always chat um, just off to the side. Okay. So uh, let's talk about the joys of data-driven engineering. Modern distributed systems, they're big. There's a lot of moving parts. That it's hard to know what's going on. There are fundamentally two ways to approach this. Faith, also known as poking something with a stick, pushing buttons, and hoping it works. Or there's the other path, which is we use data, and we use science, and we make reasoned decisions, some of which turn out to be horrible, but, and then, but we just look at the tools and the data we have available to make reasoned decisions. Unfortunately, most of the time, under conditions of panic or stress, it's normally guesswork. Everyone's been there, like, hey, uh, can we just like, reboot a server and see if it comes back to life? We've all been there. So one of the things that I'm going to kind of go through a little bit is talking about the levels and sources of insight. We, get a lot of, we can get a lot of data out of a modern back-end application if we ask for it. But a lot of times when I see people struggling with trying to resolve a live site issue or a recurring issue, is they're looking at the wrong data in the wrong way. And if we think about the hierarchy or the map of data about a live site, monitoring, metric data, essentially, logging, records of what happened, profiling, memory dumps, debugging all the way down to the one source of mostly truth, that being source code. So if we think about, and part of the journey we'll go on in the next little bit, is zooming in on a map and looking at the various sources of insight and what they can tell us. So just when you think about running your own applications in your own sites, think about your tool chest. Think about the chain of data and the things that you have available and what they can tell you. And which ones you're like, yeah, we don't have one of those. All right. So since IoT is fun, it's also incredibly hard because you have to combine software practices for embedded systems, mobile applications, and hyperscale backend all at the same time in weird and unusual ways. So I'm going to tell a little IoT story. So this is about, uh, about eight months ago. It's a very calm Friday morning, 2 a.m. in Redmond, because I agreed to take a phone call. And unfortunately, the world is fairly large, and it has time zones, and I, don't, I only live in one of them. And the customer I was working with lived very far away, about eight time zones away. So I'm on a call. Um, everything's cool. We're just getting in and we're talking about, hey, tell me about your site. Why is it having issues? So on and so forth. So we start by going, OK, what's going on? Well, we don't know. We have no logging. We have no dashboard. We have no monitoring experience. But we know that it doesn't work because our users are calling us and complaining. OK, what do we do? We have no tooling. As, my, as, as Magnus would say, um, actually, it's not that it's every customer fails to invest in goods engineering fundamentals. It's a very strong selection bias, such that the combination of you failed to invest and you have Scott Guthrie's phone number usually means I get a call. <laughs> so I will admit there's a lot of selection bias here. Most systems actually run pretty well. But it's when you don't invest in these things, combined with success, that stories like this happen. So, in absence of data, you go find some. There's always something. It may not be in a form that you can work with. It may not make sense. So in this case, I'm like, OK, you, you didn't instrument anything. So let's just grab the HTTP logs from when things happened, and let's see what the data tells us. Has anyone ever used LogParser? 
It's this wonderful little tool we created and then largely abandoned, but it's great for essentially running SQL-like queries over raw text when you have a relatively small amount of data and you don't want to spin up like some data processing engine. So most every backend site exhibits a power law distribution or a Pareto curve, depending on how you want to call it, in terms of workflows through the system. It's a very fancy way of saying there will be a very small number of code and data paths that get called most of the time. Normally, and especially in an IoT system, there tend to be 300 to 1,000 different workflows in a, large, in a reasonable scale commercial IoT solution. Four to five of them will generally occupy 95% of the work. If it's anything that involves tracking something that moves, it's almost always update location takes 95 to 98% of the workload. So what do I do? The first thing we do is we look at, let's break down the flows through the system, and let's analyze each of them for latency variation. Because the enemy of success at scale is not throughput, it's latency. So I'll go, OK, let's break down count how often do we take a path through the system, what was the min, max, average, and standard deviation of that latency, and just see if anything jumps out. So I'll do a little zoom here. And what we see is actually a little surprising. Um, it turns out that there are two there are two things that dominated the particular system during the live site incident, which were essentially getting vehicle data and getting customer data. Like, huh, so what do, what do we know already? We know the system has a crazy um, power law distribution, which is great for us as engineers because it means that if I have this huge code base, I need to optimize two paths. I need to optimize getting vehicle data, and I need to optimize getting customer data, and I can ignore the rest of it until it crashes again. And that there is a huge swing between the minimum elapsed time and the maximum elapsed time. I didn't, um, uh, I didn't plot the standard deviation. But as soon as you see like minimum and average tracking each other and this huge max, it almost always means there's some form of contention or convoy in the system. And it's like if we all got up and ran to the smallest door at once, we're going to stack up in the door. Software systems under scale behave like mechanical systems. They convoy, they jitter, they shudder, they, yeah, they um, lock up on certain things. And part of the fun in investigating these is finding out where and why, and then resolving them. So what do we know? We know that we have a power law distribution here. We know there were two workflows that mattered on this day. We know we have lots of variation, and this is indicative of resource contention, but it's just a hypothesis. So we move on to the next question, which is, let's look at this data a different way. Is the issue we're having uh, correlated with load, or is it correlated with just some confluence of events? Okay, so let's look at system load versus latency. Same data, different query. Uh, there's a few outliers. They look like they track a little bit, but by and large, there doesn't seem to be any great correlation between those outliers, those giant spikes in latency, and, um, and load. So first hypothesis out of the way. This doesn't look like this is something we can simply throw more hardware at. This looks like an actual resource contention issue. So because I occasionally live a charmed life, um, this is at about 2.30, 2.45 in the morning when we've gotten through this bit of live analysis. And uh, of course, that's when the site crashes again while I'm on the phone with them. Yeah, awesome. So obviously I'm at my sharpest at 3 in the morning. And um, they're a little desperate. And so the culture of running a live site service is that live site takes priority. I don't care if you got your mom on the phone. If the site's down, you go fix it. So... Um, we live the service culture. We're basically on with the, uh, their dev team going, OK, let's get this fixed. Let's find out what's going on. Let's sort it out. Now, since I couldn't actually make things worse at this point, since the site was down, we go, OK, uh, your biggest problem is the lights in the room are off. Let's turn on a light. So App Services has this really neat feature where you can actually live instrument a deployment with application insights without changing code. I'd never actually used the feature before, so I was like, hey, why not? Push the button. Let's see what happens. Again, couldn't make it worse. I would never do something like that on a live site at a peak load that was working, but if it's already crashed, I mean, we, we, we literally cannot make it worse. So the great thing is we were instantly, within like a minute, able to start getting new data out of the site as it was basically dying. 
So let's just come and have a little peek. Now again, at the end of the day, I actually don't care if you use App Insights or New Relic or App Dynamics or Datadog or Splunk or, or, or. I care deeply that you have something and everybody knows how to use it. Because write-only data, especially well, if you, actually I'm okay with write-only data in Azure because it ups our consumption, but it doesn't do any of you any good. So it's monitoring data has to be, people have to be able to find it, they have to be able to read it, and they have to be able to understand it under conditions of stress. Which means that if there's only one person in the office that has the magical link to open up the monitoring dashboard, that person will always be on vacation or out on sick, or out sick when you have a production learning moment. A production learning moment being a very nice way of saying the site is down. So what we're looking at is we have um, average response time during this uh, time period. It's about half a second. So not unreasonable. Again, it's, it's variable based on the workload. Uh, we have in this small section, there's about 4 million requests. So this particular site did between 10 and 30,000 requests per second. So fairly small scale. I'm not kidding, by the way. Um, we've, I, I've worked on IoT solutions that cracked close to a million operations per second. And you've got to do some pretty fancy engineering to, to kind of work on those levels. But um, so nothing really jumping out here. Everything seemed normal. So let's, let's dig in a little bit. Let's look at dependencies. So when you see uh, um, evidence of a resource contention, it's always one of two things. Everybody wants the same thing or there's not enough of a thing. And not, you know, if, I need, if I have a very CPU intensive application, everybody wants CPU. Okay, I'll add more CPUs, that's an easy problem in the cloud. <laughs> if everybody wants the same thing, the same table, the same partition, the same lock, the same something, that gets a little trickier. So let's find out what it is. So most APMs or application performance management tools have this wonderful thing where they can live instrument dependencies. So let's go and have a peek and see is what's going on here the local or the remote? So there should be some, and maybe I apologize if the numbers are a little hard to see. I can only zoom in so far. So in this particular time window, we had about um, a thousand, sorry, um, yeah, we had about 3 million requests, or sorry, 3.57 million requests in this time period. Does anybody see something really fascinating about the dependency data? I did put an arrow next to it, so. Four, three and a half million requests in, almost uh, 37 million downstream calls. So for every request that comes to the server, I have to leave the box 10 times. Wow, that, that doesn't seem awesome. Well, it's awesome for me because you're, you know, you're running the Azure meter pretty hard, but it's not awesome for your users. So, and the, um, so what we're seeing is every incoming request across the board goes to Azure tables five times, it goes to DocDB one and a half times, and it goes to SQL every other time. Well, wow, that, that seems a bit excessive to render a page. So if, you, if you're running a low scale system without a lot of users, brute force works. You can have chatty systems, you can be inefficient, it's okay. But once you tip over that inflection point of success, all of your engineering debt, all of your deferred decisions, all of your that will never happen gets called in very quickly. So let's have a peek. Oh, and so then we also come in and we look at the uh, failed requests. And we can see that the majority of failed requests are on get current location for vehicles. You know, anything that moves, it's always going to be updating or getting. Doesn't matter what it is. Uh, whether it's um, any automotive tracking system is going to look like this. It's going to have some flavor. I've done about 10 of them at this point, and they all look remarkably the same. Because at a certain point, figuring out if you have a vehicle and it drives around, the, you know, the most common thing somebody's going to want to know is where is it and what's it doing. And then we look at the, the total dependency failures. And for whatever reason, we are getting a crazy number of failures against table storage. Hmm, that seems like there could be something funky going on there. So let's review our new data, and let's, let's think about what it means. So every new request of a certain type, um, because again, I, I, took a, I took basically the, the, the ones that were being the most nasty. 17 calls to SQL. Well, 
So what does that tell us? If I'm looking at a particular page and I'm seeing a huge number of calls out to SQL, what are, what, what are the common reasons that could be happening? S starts with entity, ends with framework. So I'm not actually bagging entity framework specifically. It's that a lot of the entity modeling tools are the, um, what do we call those things? Anyway, um, they don't always do a great job of mapping what you want as a developer, what the database wants to give you, and that goop in the middle. Again, at low scale, or the other 200 workflows in a system that don't have to basically, they're not on the hot operational path, a little bit of inefficient data modeling is fine. But if you were on the hot path through the system on your user's patient span, you can't go and basically go back and forth to SQL 17 times to render a page. It doesn't work. Um, but the one that's really interesting here is an 88% table storage failure rate. That seems excessive. So any, any theories on any patterns you guys could think of where I it basically, the site is technically working. It's not, it's not failing to render pages. It's just slow and at a certain point it tips over and dies. But it's functionally correct. So any thoughts about what, you know, an 88% failure rate against the dependency? and it shows huge volumes could, uh, could mean against table storage. Against SQL, the, this whole basically entity relation mapping is a likely suspect, but for table storage? Hmm? Too many requests. Oh, well, it was definitely too many requests, but any thoughts about why we would have so many seemingly failed requests that don't affect the success of the, of the, the page rendering? It's checking if the page rendering. And uh, the gentleman in the front is entirely correct. N uh, not only is it, this code appears to be checking if a given table exists 15 times for every page render. And we'll actually get to the real code. Um, I'll skip ahead to the punchline for this one. That condition costs them $120,000 a month. Because <laughs> if you think about it, if you're rendering 20 to 30,000 requests a second, and for every one of those, you basically go to a backing resource and you ask it 15 times, are you really, really, really sure you created that table? I mean, I was here like six picoseconds ago and you might, not have, you might have deleted it since then. Success magnifies the flaws in your engineering choices. All right, so let's go and have a little peek at, yeah. So in this particular context, three million requests in, 64 million calls to SQL. We should probably dig into that. Uh, 21 million to DocDB, whole bunch to, you know, the actual volume of storage isn't that high. They just almost all fail. Azure Blob, da da da. The other thing is, um, and this was bluntly, this is a design flaw in the earlier versions of the Azure storage libraries. I think we've resolved this now. I haven't looked in the last couple months, which is, a table not existing is not an exceptional case. It's actually fairly common. But if it's in .NET code, if that is rendered as an exception, an exception is an incredibly expensive way to do an if statement, especially if you're doing it a million times a second. All right, so we'll peek ahead. So we've seen some data. The time is pull back. What do we know? How do we know it? What do we think the issue could be? And what experiment do we need to run? Or what data do we need to refine in order to be able to narrow down the search space of what could be happening? Because most of the time, especially in complex systems, it's never one thing. It's five to six things coming together at exactly the wrong time in a completely unexpected way. We know we have chattiness, we know we have table storage calls, and we know that we have variation. So. We know we have very application, very chatty application code, so the natural hypothesis is that there are shared resource convoys. Those could be local resources on the application tier. They could be some shared resource on a backing tier, or probably both. And, um, oh, hey, I think I actually lost the slide here. Oh, no, no, we're good. All right, so let's, let's start by just crossing out the obvious. Maybe we ran out of resources on the back end. Maybe we didn't, we got throttled on storage. Maybe we get, um, uh, maybe we get throttled on storage. Maybe we didn't have enough DTUs assigned. All right, so we just do a little quick Azure monitor check. If I'm running at, well, one, I'm over provisioned. 
But again, if you're on fire and you're hungry, do you want a fire extinguisher or a sandwich? If you're doing a live site remediation, you want to fix the issue. You want to work on uh, optimizing cogs later. So in this world, we basically we have these nice daily spikes. Looks pretty reasonable. But at no time are we exceeding like uh, 25 to 30% of our deployed resources. The magic number tends to be about 70 to 80% in that for a lot of systems, once you exceed 70 to 80% of uh, resource capacity, you can get into a metastable condition, meaning you just tip over and thrash uh, for interactive workloads. All right. So then we are... Uh, we're also going to have a quick peek down here at our um, our DTUs. No, we we never really get it, but we get some like really heavy spikes. That speaks to me of some form of reporting workload that's being triggered that's just coming in like a hammer. But by and large, we're never really getting above um, sixty percent. So okay, uh, we've ruled that out. Let's go to that next obvious uh, dependency, which is Azure Storage. The blue line is successful requests. The green line is failed ones. Wow. That, okay. We're doing something horrible. And it's tracking linearly. The two are tracking extremely linearly, which means that in the context of a single request, I tend to get X number of failed requests and one or two successful ones. All right. And this might feel like it's a bit of a meandering journey. And it is and it will be. Because a lot of the times, like the, when I tell you the story, the nicely bundled package story with the screenshots and the arrows, I'm, t I'm leading you down a journey that is obvious in hindsight. And they almost, almost all performance issues are obvious in hindsight. But they tend to be very difficult and very challenging to understand in the heat of the moment. All right. So let's have a peek at are the error conditions. So we know that we had lots and lots and lots of requests, but then a few actually failed. There were actual full-blown failed requests. So we come in and we have a look on the dependencies. We know that we have a ton of table storage, uh, table failures, uh, but again, they don't seem to be affecting things that actually blow up. So, so 1.35 million requests in this time frame, 271 failures. That's actually a pretty good failure rate. It's like 0.01%. It's actually pretty good. So we, we drill in on that. And all of this is just standard out of the box App Insight stuff. You just turn it on and you get all this stuff for free. But if you haven't used the tool and you don't know how to drill through, then you can't realize a lot of the value here. So we come in and we look at Almost all of the failed operations are for get current location for vehicle. It's fuzzy by design, so I'll just read out and tell you what it is. So we drill down into that particular failed operation, and we can see that, okay, I got an exception. It's a null ref. And it turns out that in an unauthentication chain, there was a null reference failure. So authentication is a single point of failure. Identity is a single point of failure by design. You cannot have a secure system that does not treat the authentication subsystem as a thing that if it fails, you will fail the request. Otherwise, you just turn on anonymous access and just you know, party on. So when I look at systems and I think about identifying like uh, cascading failure conditions, I almost always start with authorization and authentication because that's the thing that everybody hits. It's the one path through the system. In, the, in this specific case, what was going on was that essentially it was a it was a four part authentication flow go to data store a go to data store b go to data store c and it was a pretty common case of not checking response codes you know we got we love the classics we like to you know call a remote service and not check to see if it succeeded or not because two developers had not agreed on the contract one of them thought that the appropriate response to an external dependency failure was to return null. The consumer of that API thought they would get an exception if it failed. Surprise! And this specific condition only manifested itself when the site peaked above uh, about 15,000 requests a second. So it never showed up in functional testing. But it's 200 failed requests of 2.4 million. This is a distraction. We've, we've annoyed one person out of 50,000. I mean, if I can get through a day without just annoying the one of the 50 people I meet, I think I'm doing pretty good. So that is a distraction. We park it. We move on. It is not relevant to the live site crash. 
All right. So what we also come in and see is this wonderful thing where uh, an error occurred attempting to create a connection. I know it's really fuzzy. Um, the timeout expired. I couldn't get a connection from the connection pool. So all right, you're all, oh, smoking gun. I have a connection pool failure in SQL, that evil, evil SQL trying to you know, reuse connections. Anytime you see a, so when I talked about local shared resources, a connection pool is a locally shared resource that is specific to the instance. So if you have a particular piece of code that happens to pull out lots of connections and hold them, it's stealing those connections as a shared resource from every other request on the box at that point in time. So when you see these, this is not a root cause. This is just a symptom of in here, some, one of two things is happening. There's either inefficient code that is overusing that resource, or you made the connection pool too small. But again, we, we look at it in context going, you know, this was a few hundred requests out of a few million. Is it a problem? Is it not a problem? Turns out it's actually a problem. Because once you hit that point, the system could never recover. It wasn't shedding load. It wasn't, I don't know, rate limiting. Because uh, tying back to, to the prior talk. So essentially what was happening is as soon as the system hit that particular condition, it locked itself into this never-ending loop. And um, does anyone want to guess why? This one is really, in, this, is ex this is a pattern that is extremely endemic to IoT systems. I have seen it three times in production now. Um, and it's actually, it actually has a lot to do with how most IoT projects are built, which is the folks who build the devices tend to be very good at electrical engineering and digital design and firmware and thinking about the world one device at a time. The folks who build the back end tend to be good at distributed systems and back end and data systems. And a lot of times they don't ever actually talk to each other. I've been on projects where the folks who built the devices and the folks who built the cloud services were contractually prevented from communicating at all. Um, I'm just like, I'm sure somebody thought that was a good idea, but I'm not entirely sure how or why. It is very common in IoT systems when you send a, a, a message, especially for the, the systems that are not using reliable communication. So they say if somebody's basically just blasting a UDP packet out into the world, is that they don't get a positive acknowledgement within 10 seconds or 15 seconds, they send it again. And then they send it again. And then they send it again. OK, that doesn't seem, if you're thinking about the world one device at a time, that doesn't seem too bad, right? Right, so let's think back to the first talk of the day. And we have basically queue-based systems in the middle that are acting as rate converters, buffering messages, and then uh, processing them. What are the ordering semantics uh, by default of all of these systems? First in, first out. So if I'm sending one message every second, and then I slow down and I can only process 0 0.9 messages, what happens? You uh, actually, you will, you, you won't crash per se, but what will happen is your queue will grow to an infinite length and all data updates stop happening because for some reason, we've had, we basically most systems are built that it should be fair. You should be first in, first out. No, actually in an IoT system, the most relevant event and the one that is the most latency sensitive is the thing that has just happened. So if you're really looking at designing for scale, your message processing systems have to dump data on the floor and process it later. But I digress. What was actually, so that was what was happening here. Essentially, the retry policy that was built into the clients and the devices had no back off semantic. The system had no load shedding. So essentially, once it got above that magical tipping point, it's basically most of the time the system was just walking on the line. But one foot over, and now you're in a metastable condition. The system could not self recover because it locked itself into failure. And it was no one smoking gun. There was no one root cause. It was essentially all of these things coming together to create a load-related metastable condition. So a lot of times, it's really easy to get tunnel vision when you're doing performance diagnostics and tuning, which is you have a hypothesis, and then you start hunting for data to validate that hypothesis. Because we're smart engineers, and we love being right. 
So of course we look for data that, that confirms that. So it's always good when we're doing these things to take a step back, to pull back and go, you know what? Let's, maybe we're getting a little too deep on this one path of investigation. Let's come back up and look at the problem from a slightly different way. Maybe do a little bit of debugging by confession and see if anything jumps out. So in this particular case, we come out, we look at performance, and we look at individual requests. So what we do is, one of the great things you can do in App Insights is you can say, show me my slowest operations sort them by count, and then look at the distribution. Essentially, the same thing I did with ugly log parser code, I get as an out-of-the-box experience in App Insights. So I come in, I sort by count. Hey, why are my, that's fascinating, the two most common operations are serving static files. Hmm, I guess I don't have my static file handler in IIS configured correctly. And that should probably be in CDN. Hmm. That seems like something we should fix, but not during a live site. So we bring up the, the, the dynamic one, and we can see that the, uh, so for this particular case, there was 400,000 requests, a median of 2.2 milliseconds. I don't know about you folks, but if something on a web page takes two, takes two seconds to render, I'm already like three apps in. I'm a very impatient individual. But more importantly, the 95th percentile is 20 milliseconds. Oh, sorry, 20 seconds, 20,000 milliseconds. That's very indicative of stacking. All right, so let's go and let's drill in on an individual request. So we go in, we look for an operation that happened to run slow. We get a set of them. So we're basically looking at a set of about 10,000 requests. And let's just click on one. And there's this really other nice feature I happen to like, which I didn't actually know about until I found it live. Uh, so knowing your tools is important, which actually gives you a timeline view of your dependency calls. So essentially what this is, is for this specific individual request, here are the remote calls. And there's something really fascinating about this pattern. So it's a timeline graph. Anything in, um, is that magenta, fuchsia, I'm not too good with colors, um, is, a, is a remote call that failed. So what we see is, before we do anything, we take several seconds to go to table storage, one, two, three, four, a pause, one, two, three, four, five, and then go to SQL. That's indicative of a repository pattern doing initialization, multiple repository patterns doing chained initialization on a per operation basis. So didn't affect the, didn't, didn't do anything to the request except make it take a really long time. Well, guess what? We can probably just go in and comment that code out. Then we come down a little bit lower on the, uh, yep. Yeah. The other thing is you couldn't see the whole thing. I actually had to run a query, which is say, give me every dependency event from this request. There were 127 remote calls to fulfill this. Uh -huh, this seems a bit much. All right, so we come in and we have, we, we have a look. And we see that, okay, we had, a, we had a long running request basically take a whole bunch of time on a service bus call. But that happened once out of three million requests. It's a red herring. Always, it's easy to get caught up on the data, think like, oh my God, this is the terrible thing, I have to jump in on it, but going, if it happened once out of a million calls, it, it may be important, it may not be, but don't get fixated. So, we did a bunch of data gathering, we come back up and we go, okay, we, we, we still know all these things, we've refined it, we've gotten a little bit more information, what's the next step? So what actually happened here is three things oh, that all came together at the same time. Incredibly chatty interaction on the, on the hot path. But just on the hot path. I don't care if the thing that runs once a week that nobody looks at directly is slow. I've got to optimize the hot path. And it's okay to do different things on the hot path. It's okay to break your policies. It's okay to break the conventions. Um, I had a fascinating conversation, actually I got yelled at at the MVP summit a few years ago, when I said, you know, by and large, I mean, Entity Framework's a great uh, developer efficiency and kind of uh, tool. But there are times you may go, I need something, I need to optimize this one line through. For my 50 of my controllers, I might use Entity Framework, and for the one that gets called all the time, I might hand optimize that code. It's okay to use multiple techniques, especially on your hot path. Um, so my chatty dependency interaction, you just need to kind of figure out where that's going. Extraneous calls to table storage, and there was also an internal lock. 
I didn't actually put it in the slide deck, but um, and this one is hilariously common. Every time that a log record was, lit was uh, written out, there was a lock acquired. If you do 100 a second, no big deal. You don't even notice it. The problem with shared locks is they're fine, they're fine, they're fine, you're dead. And that, that once you just get one request above that tipping point, it's all over. So let's have a look at the line of code that costs them about $120,000 a month. All right, so obviously this is not the actual source code. So let's have uh, just a, you know, a very, just a very big, oh, sorry, I'm in um, presenter mode, so of course it doesn't actually show my code. Uh, let's go back to duplicate. There we go. So pretty innocuous bit of code. Um, I bought in on all this repository pattern stuff. You know, patterns are awesome. Let's use all of them. So I've got a wrapper. I got a repository pattern. Does all my goodness. I got my data model, and I'm just going to go and insert. Seems completely innocuous. Everything's awesome, right? So let's go in and have the my new data wrapper. It is a subclass of my super cool repository pattern for storage of T, and I give it a storage connection string and table name. This, pretty much, you could take this from some of our samples. Again, all completely innocuous. Sometimes you have to dig pretty deep, but you just follow the chain. So in this case, I have my super cool repository pattern for storage, and there is the one line of pain, which exemplifies two absolutely terrible anti-patterns. So one is, um, scope of instantiation and scope of operation. If you have a thing that must be done once, or at least once, do it in a startup. Do it on instantiation. But, and this is actually, I blame some of our samples for this, which is in order to, a lot of the sample patterns, they show ease of getting started, which is they don't cleanly separate roles and times. So the first thing is, this is a thing that you need to do, but it should only be called once per node. If I do this once across 1,000 machines, and then I go make 50 or 100 million uh, table um, or storage requests, it's fine. If I have to do this on every single operation, and then it throws an exception, which then unrolls the stack, and then gets swallowed, and then I do it again, this becomes a giant problem. But the other part is, I have synchronous code with a dependency in a constructor. I can't await this thing, so it means that for the, uh, essentially, the, uh, the, the web server request pipeline, it's like the grocery store. It's a bounded concurrency dispatcher. So while I'm waiting for this request to come back from off box, I'm blocking any other requests from using my dispatch slot and my dispatch thread. So this one didn't actually 503 out. I have no idea how. But any, in a modern .NET app, if you're going to leave the process boundary, you need to be in an async await context, full stop, which means that you can't do silly stuff like this in a constructor. If you do need to do asynchronous initialization, use a factory pattern with a protected constructor, and then just call an you know, initialize async method through the factory. Whether you do that directly or DI, it's your choice. Just don't, if you have IO in your constructor, you are doing something horribly wrong. And, you, and if you're doing it really horribly wrong at enough scale, you may get to meet me in a less fun environment. All right, so that was, that was all it was. Well, there, was three, there, was, there was multiple of these things, but that pattern, just that little bit right there in that one base class was a $100,000 a month mistake. And because there was no logging, nobody knew. Um, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna tell this particular story on film, but ask me afterwards and I'll tell you why there was no logging in this particular system. All right, how are we doing on... We doing on time, all right. I have no idea because I forgot to turn my stopwatch on. Uh, I think we're at about 40. So I've been rambling for a bit, telling a few stories, and y'all are very quiet. So I think it's time for some audience heckling. Good time for audience heckling. So is any like what is any of this kind of resonating? If folks kind of seeing these patterns, like so, uh, who's running like a, a live service? Doesn't have to be an Azure, but basically like a live backend service right now. What are you guys using for monitoring? App Insights, good. Cool. Uh, we we Kool Aid all around. Love it. Oh yeah, Dan, you don't count. <laughs> so, um, so, 
Uh, actually, I, I'm actually all a good heckling questions. I'll just tell you another good one. This is what happens when I've had like three hours of sleep in two days. I might, my heckling powers are reduced. Hmm? Ah! See, I can't even work a, I can't even work a laptop today. Someone don't, don't let me commit code today. All right. So this is a, this is a suitably anonymized one. I can actually give you the source code for this app because it's a, it's an anonymized one I built for build last year. But this actually happened. Um, and it's actually something we built by accident. So imagine we have a, a digital, um, digital game. We want to do hourly prize giveaways on digital assets. So a spike mode application. Different classes of workloads are susceptible to runaway success. Anything that's open world can go viral or has a synchronized activity can usually end in tears. So we have a very canonical basic web app, SQL, Redis, kind of your, you know, your trifecta. And this happens. So the site is slow. Who's heard this from business folks, users? It's just this nice emotionally laden, the site is slow, you're a terrible person, make it better. We've, we've been there. So this is a qualitative, emotionally focused statement. I'm not denying its legitimacy, but as an engineer, I can't work with that. Because I don't know when someone will be happy in a way that I can measure it across a bunch of users. It's valid, but it's not actionable from an engineering perspective. And without knowing what fast enough is, I can't formulate a plan. Who is it slow for? Is it slow for everybody or is it just slow for Dan? If it's just slow for Dan, I don't know that I care all that much. I was, uh, as long as we're consistent. Uh, I was working on a project five or six years ago now, and uh, the, the, the system had 20 or 30 million users, and it was great for everybody, but there was one user it didn't work for. And normally you might be like, no big deal, it's just one user. The only challenge was that user was the chairman of the board for that company. So he was understandably upset he couldn't use his own app from his house in Malibu, because, you know, rough life. So we had ended up, had, someone had to go out to his house and basically see like, that it didn't actually work. Because the application at the time had good server-side monitoring, but it didn't implement good client-side monitoring, so we couldn't cross-correlate. Um, so this like, week-long, lots of screaming, people having to go out, drive along the Pacific Coast Highway, um, debacle, turned out to be root caused to a pillow. I'm not making this up. Uh, the gentleman's wife didn't like the noise coming from the router in their house, so she put a pillow on it. <laughs> and it heated up just enough to cause intermittent connection drops. So in hindsight, actually even in hindsight, I'm like, no, I would not have done a pillow check on the router. <laughs> uh, yeah, insufficient monitoring. We did not, because if we had client-side monitoring, I'd been like, yeah, it's definitely a problem with your internet connection. So slow for whom? Is it for all users, a subset of users? Is it slow at certain times of day? And does it matter? What's slow? Is it the end user's internet connection? Is it the server? Is it the back end? Is it the user interface? Which is why we need data. And more to the point, we need to have service level objectives that we can actually track to. So let's start with a statement. The site must respond to all valid operational calls within 500 milliseconds. Sounds great, right? Obviously, you know this is a leading question by now. Um, what's wrong with this? Why is this like, if, you, if someone hands this to you as an engineer, you should run away screaming. But why? So 100% adherence to SLO is, as a starting point, is impractical. Because something always goes wrong. Because essentially what this says is, you're ta now taking responsibility for end user's internet connection. There's nothing in there that it's a valid request, but if it never gets to you. Anything that basically has a flat latency distribution is designed for failure. You really, when we're talking about latency, we have to talk about percentiles. And this also, most importantly, asserts infinite scale. All I said was 500 milliseconds. I didn't say any, anything about the site not handling or not handling a million operations per second. And if you don't have, you know, a scale target, you can't test against it, and you can't load shed to it. And if you can't load shed to it, all systems have breaking points. All systems have inherent scale limits. The only question comes down to, will you find them, or will your customers find them in production? You're always testing in production, whether or not you uh, want to be. So let's just do a quick, um, here's a better one. 
the site must respond to 99.99% of all valid operational calls within 500 milliseconds at the 90th percentile, up to 25,000 requests a second. It's not perfect, but it's not a bad start. All right, so there's a whole bunch of stuff here, and if you're curious about it, you just watch my build presentation from last year about the process of going through. But I figured we'd actually look at some data in the you know, last few minutes and just show a couple of patterns. So uh, if folks are not, have not seen InfluxDB in Grafana, it's a lovely little package for doing um, metrics calculation, aggregation, and, and visualization. I'm a huge fan. Uh, it doesn't displace something like Application Insights as an APM. I'm very much a believer in compositional experiences. But especially if you're in uh, Kubernetes land or any form of container orchestrator, this is a, a lovely little thing that you can leverage. So we're looking at basically a pathetically small number of requests per second with some spikes and these insane uh, latency jumps. Again, we, wanna, we always start from request volume and latency distribution. Mean is not great. Averages tell lies, evil, dirty lies, but it's better than nothing. And so we come and we basically know that we've got our latency percentiles in the 20 seconds. Obviously, we're well past our 500 millisecond target. Yep. And then I can come over here and I could look at my, my, P, my P50s, my P95s, and see that, okay, they're, they're pretty bad. They're pretty stacked, too. But if my, average is 20 millis if, if my average is hitting 20 seconds, I don't even need to look at my P95. I already know that I'm in trouble. And uh, this dashboard is actually online as a snapshot if you want to go and have a peek. I request the second not high, so I, clearly I have something horribly wrong with my code. So then we dig in a little bit, and we basically say, hey, um, what do we have going on? F this is actually the logging that comes out of HA proxy by default. So if you have a front end reverse proxy, HA proxy, an Nginx, an Envoy, a traffic, you can actually get a lot of really rich data without having to change your application much at all. So in this case, I come in, I see my crazy pr latency percentiles. I see that it's uh, all on my ping API. And I can see that I've got a whole bunch of server wait time, which means I'm waiting for the thing downstream to respond, as opposed to I'm getting jammed up. And um, requests per second per URI look pretty reasonable. So essentially, the key thing is that as far as HA proxy is concerned, it's not queuing requests. So this is not load related. But the web server is definitely stacking up. All right, then we come in. We, we do our same thing. We do our uh, infrastructure check. Web CPU is a little high, actually. 50% at tw you know, fifty percent of a CPU at 20 requests a second. I've probably written some pretty terrible code. Uh, memory usage, it's growing, but it looks to be relatively flat. And um, bytes in, bytes out, pretty small. Memory usage, front-end CPU. So, again, nothing... No, uh, no glaring thing here. More importantly, my dependencies have lots of headroom. Same pattern. Scalability bottlenecks, not enough of a thing. Variable latency response, increased error rates, linear to sublinear degradation. I either need to use more of things or use bigger things. And everybody wants the same thing, this is the hard one. Variable error response latency, increased error rates, sharp tipping point to infinity. If you see that basically that, that latency jump to infinity, you can usually assert that's going on. So I'm learning a little bit out of time, so I'll just kind of skip ahead. This is just a, sn uh, a little bit of I pulled out as uh, honestly filler from build from last year. So um, turns out I talked about those layers of insight. In this case, the right thing to get insight from was a profiler. So I basically go and pull out dot .trace, use whichever one you like, I don't really care. And I do basically a thread stall analysis, basically where am I waiting, because I'm doing a latency analysis. Uh, if I tried to debug this using a memory dump, like WinDBG, I would never find this problem because it's a problem over time. All right, do my wait analysis, I get my thread stack. You know, I basically see that, hey, as expected, everything stacks up in ping controller dot get. And then I see my lovely little smoking gun, which is get, doesn't take long at all, but I have this thing called tracer.log that is taking all of the time. Hmm, that seems a bit odd. That shouldn't be going on, right? All right, application seems blocked in trace.log. So, 
This seems really obvious. I've boiled it down so that it is glaringly obvious, but I have seen the same pattern, not the same obvious implementation, in production on multiple occasions. Even something as simple as, anyone using log for net? Okay. Anyone using a file writer with log for net? Yeah, was, that, was that a yes? Okay. So if you had ever used log for net with a file writer, you have this in your code. Because that's actually how it doesn't actually take a full lock. It takes an operating system wait call. So if you're under sufficient volumes, trying to basically append to the tail pointer of a file effectively takes out a lock under load. So these convoys, they hide in strange and unusual places. So this is obviously contrived, but a blocking call in a hot operational path and synchronized access to resources used by the hot paths cause all sorts of ripple. And you can look for these patterns in your data and pluck them out and burn them down. So that was just a one and a half little stories of um, some of the things that I get, to, uh, I get to have fun with. Success will expose your technical debt. It'll, it'll call it in. And it's OK. You can't fix everything. You, sh you really can't try. Just be targeted and efficient about like the 3% of your code that really matters under load. You've got to slow down to move fast. You've got to think clearly. You've got to be driven by data. Because I've seen teams take four months of guessing rather than going, we just got to slow down and calmly evaluate our data. Bottlenecks are caused by contention, local or global. And you, if you throw more hardware at a contention problem, you will make it worse, which is why identifying the pattern, whether it's I don't have enough of something or everybody wants the same thing, is so critically important. All software systems have a breaking strain. Find it before your users do. It'll be a little bit calmer. <laughs>